All good. Audio here. test. Check one two one two set one set two set three recorder one recorder two recorder three recorder four. Check check check. All good. We are live. Awesome. Mahalo nui for that, Ed. So aloha to all. Aloha kakahiaka. It is about a little bit after four o'clock in the morning. In Hawaii, uh, in particular, Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument, we welcome all of you as we are headed down to the seafloor. Um, we're going to do a brief introduction of our um, crew that's in the van, the control van that will be with you for the next four hours. This is the four to eight o'clock shift, and um, we are headed down. Uh, to see uh, some amazing archaeology, hopefully, and um, share that with you all live. Oh, no. Ed, are you hearing that, like... Yeah. Ed, are you yeah. hearing that, like I think I know where that's coming from, too. Stand by. I think one of our shore participants is listening to the uh, live stream. I'm nope, still there. And uh, as a result, the audio that we're saying over the intercom is being delayed and then fed back. So I'm going to see if I can figure out which user it is and unfortunately take them offline. If you're one of our shoreside participants connecting using OET's V-Link access, please make sure your uh, microphone is muted, your talk button is turned off, so we don't hear ourselves. That's still there, eh? Uh, Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Disabling them. Test, test, test. Okay, I think that's either, uh, I think it's uh, June's account, maybe? Well, if you're using VLink and try and contact us and are unsuccessful, please contact Dan or Megan. All right, we're good-ish. Okay, good-ish is good. Yep. Yep. All right. So, yes, so thank you for joining us, um, everyone. Aloha, kakahiaka, konnichiwa to our uh, oh, friends in Japan. There you go. We welcome all of you um, on this really historic dive occurring right now in real time as you're watching it live from the Nautilus. We are on expedition NA-154, Ala Aumoana Kaiuli, the path of the deep sea traveler. And we are headed down to the 5,400 meter mark um, to see if we can have a visual of the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier, the Kaga. The Kaga means increased joy and was named after the former Kaga province in Southwest Japan. Um, is it a, uh, sorry, I'm not trying to uh, correct, but it, is it a province or what's the word, prefecture? Um, probably prefecture, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I think that's in English, it might be province, yes. prefecture, yeah, yeah. yep, in Southwest Japan. And it, it is a historically significant World War II aircraft carrier that fought and was sunk during the Battle of Midway. So mahalo to all of you for joining us. We're going to do a quick uh, introduction of the team in the van. So I'll start off. My name is Malia Evans. I am an Outreach and Education Coordinator on behalf of Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. 
Um, my background is in um, terrestrial archaeology and ethnography and just so um, happy and, and honored to be a part of this um, expedition. And so I'm going to hand it off to our wonderful colleague, Hannah. Good morning. So I'm Hannah Parody. I am a part of the science and data team, but specifically science, and I'm a geologist. And I'm from California State University, Long Beach, and I'm a grad student there. So, yeah. And I've been meaning for, I don't know, two weeks, however long we've been out here, to mention to you that our home port is at the Port of Los Angeles at San Pedro. Did you know that? No, but also, I can kind of not, your, your voice oh. is a little low to me. Uh, yeah, you're, it's weird, you're coming in, you've always come in low though. How's that? Check, check, check. I can hear you, yes. Okay. Yeah, we're uh, just across the bridge in San Pedro uh, at oh, Alta Sea. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, obviously, we won't be there for a little while, mm -hmm. but in a couple of years, we'll go back. Yeah. Wow. Uh, did you ever bump into Mike Marin there? No. Wow. He's done and moved on, but he's an RV pilot from here uh, wow. who did his undergrad, I think, at CSULB. Wow. Or no, CSO. Is it Cal? Cal CSULB. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're cool. right. Cool. That's exciting. Uh, Doctor Mike, whenever you're ready for an introduction, take your time. I'm ready. Hello, everyone. Okay. Mike Brennan, uh, maritime archaeologist with Search Inc. I'm the lead archaeologist and co-lead scientist for this mission. Excited to be here. Good morning, everyone. I'm Hans van Tilburg. I'm a maritime archaeologist and historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And in fact, Malia and I work in the same place, the uh, uh, Daniel Kanue Regional Center on Ford Island in Honolulu, Hawaii.
Oh, Audio head. test, check, one, two, one, two, set one, set two, set three, recorder one, recorder two, recorder three, recorder four, check, 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 all good, we are live. Awesome, mahalo nui for that, Ed. So aloha to all, aloha kakahiaka, it is about a little bit after four o'clock in the morning in Hawaii, uh, in particular, Papahanao Mokoakea Marine National Monument. We welcome all of you as we are headed down to the seafloor. Um, we're going to do a brief introduction of our um, crew that's in the van, the control van that will be with you for the next four hours. This is the four to eight o'clock shift. And um, we are headed down uh, to see uh, some amazing archaeology, hopefully. And I'm um, share that with you all live. Oh no. Ed, are you hearing that like Yeah. Ed, are you yeah. hearing that like I well? think I know where that's coming from too. Stand by. I think one of our shore participants is listening to the uh, live stream. Live? Nope, still there. And uh, as a result, the audio that we're saying over the intercom is being delayed and then fed back. So, I'm going to see if I can figure out which user it is and unfortunately take them offline. If you're one of our shoreside participants connecting using OET's V-Link access, please make sure your uh, microphone is muted, your talk button is turned off so we don't hear ourselves. That's still there, eh? Uh, Test, test, test. Disabling them. Test, test, test. Okay, I think that's either, uh, I think it's uh, June's account, maybe? Well, if you're using VLink and try and contact us and are unsuccessful, please contact Dan or Megan. All right, we're good-ish. Okay, good-ish is good. Yep. Yep. All right. So, yes, so thank you for joining us, um, everyone. Aloha, kakahiaka, konnichiwa to our uh, oh, friends in Japan. There you go. We welcome all of you um, on this really historic dive occurring right now in real time as you're watching it live from the Nautilus. We are on Expedition NA-154, Ala Aumoana Kaiuli, the path of the deep sea traveler. And we are headed down to the 5,400 meter mark um, to see if we can have a visual of the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier, the Kaga. The Kaga means increased joy and was named after the former Kaga province in Southwest Japan. Um, is it a, uh, sorry, I'm not trying to uh, correct, but is, is it a province or what's the word, prefecture? Um, probably prefecture, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I think that's in English, it might be province, yes. prefecture, yeah, yeah. yep, in Southwest Japan. And it is a historically significant World War II aircraft carrier that fought and was sunk during the Battle of Midway. So mahalo to all of you for joining us. We're going to do a quick uh, introduction of the team in the van. So I'll start off. My name is Malia Evans. I am an Outreach and Education Coordinator on behalf of Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. 
Um, my background is in um, terrestrial archaeology and ethnography, and just so um, happy and, and honored to be a part of this um, expedition. And so I'm going to hand it off to our wonderful colleague, Hannah. Good morning. So I'm Hannah Parody. I am a part of the science and data team, but specifically science, and I'm a geologist. And I'm from California State University, Long Beach, and I'm a grad student there. So, yeah. And I've been meaning for, I don't know, two weeks, however long we've been out here, to mention to you that our home port is at the Port of Los Angeles at San Pedro. Did you know that? No, but also, I can kind of not... Your, your voice oh. is a little low to me. Uh, yeah, you're, it's weird. You're coming in. You've always come in low, though. How's that? Check, check, check. I can hear you, yes. Okay. Yeah, we're uh, just across the bridge in San Pedro uh, at oh, Alta Sea. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so, uh, obviously, we won't be there for a little while, mm -hmm. but in a couple of years, we'll go back. Yeah. Wow. Uh, did you ever bump into Mike Marin there? No. Wow. He's done and moved on, but he's an RV pilot from here uh, wow. who did his under grad, I think, at CSULB. Wow. Uh, no, CSO. Is it Cal? Cal CSULB. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're cool. right. Cool. That's exciting. Uh, Dr. Mike, whenever you're ready for an introduction, take your time. I'm ready. Hello, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Mike Brennan, uh, Maritime Archaeologist with Search Inc. I'm the lead archaeologist and co-lead scientist for this mission. I'm excited to be here. Good morning, everyone. I'm Hans van Tilburg. I'm a maritime archaeologist and historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And in fact, Malia and I work in the same place, the uh, uh, Daniel Kanue Regional Center on Ford Island in Honolulu, Hawaii. What a beautiful facility, too. Yeah, it is. And in, in fact, I, I spent... What a beautiful facility, too. Yeah, it is. And in, in fact, I, I spent some time near San Pedro, huh. living on a boat on Terminal Island, going oh, yeah. to College of Oceaneering. Wow. I spent no shortage of time uh, waiting to get through security to get on the Ford Island. <laughs> that can get backed up at times. <laughs> It sure can, especially in the mornings yeah. when everybody's trying to get to work. Sebastian? Hey everyone, I'm Sebastian Martinez. I'm an undergraduate research at University of Hawaii at Manoa's Deep Sea Fish Ecology Lab. Um, I will be your guys' biologist for the next couple hours as we look at all this amazing archaeology. Mahalo, Sebastian. Hey, Derek. I are you able to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Uh, Derek Sowers here. I work for Ocean Exploration Trust as the Mapping Operations Manager, and I'll be serving as the navigator for this dive. Mahalo, Derek. What about you, Tito? OK, Tito, we can't hear you. Oh, I'll boost him up. And if you can get your mic right Hit up the, against uh, your Oh, there you go. Down on the SPL. Yeah, there you go. That's good. Let's try this. All right, good morning. This yeah, that's is so uh, much better. Can you hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, Alberto Colacious Jr., otherwise uh, known as Tito. I'm a regular employee at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute as chief pilot and expedition leader with Jason. And I'm out here uh, moonlighting a bit uh, for the next couple of weeks and uh, really excited about diving on Kaga this morning. <clears throat> what about you, Jake? All right, I'm Jake Bonney. I'm sitting here in the Atalanta seat. And uh, at, at home, I'm a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island studying ocean engineering. And last but not least, Ed. You know, uh, I am going to pass on my intro today, just uh, being mindful of the intent of this dive. So I'm passing. Yes, and you know what? Thank you for bringing that up because we have been, um, from the beginning, being very respectful and honoring 
the deep and long history of the place that we are currently in and the modern history uh, that occurred with uh, the Battle of Midway in 1942. And so as we descend into the depths of Kanaloa, the god of the ocean, from the Hawaiian perspective, we honor the life that was, um, sh you know, taken uh, by the tragedy of war. And we have a deep reverence for the events that occurred. So we're going to pass it on to our archaeologists um, if they want to give us a little bit of historical context on what we'll be seeing down um, on the seafloor. Mike? Yeah, thanks, Malia. Um, so Kaga was, um, uh, portions of the wreck were found in 2019 by the Nauticos uh, expeditions. Um, and then the, the wreck was found in 20, I'm sorry, that was 1999. And in 2019, it was found in uh, with a AUV survey uh, by Vulcan Inc. Uh, off the research vessel Petrol. Um, and they did a, a quick, uh, I think like hour or 90 minute dive to confirm the identity so so there has been eyes on this wreck um and we're going to come down and do uh, a little bit more thorough of a, of a dive um i expect that it's going to be um similar in appearance to the akagi dive from yesterday um this this wreck was hit or this ship was hit uh four times with bombs um on the flight deck and then similarly uh caused massive fires uh, throughout the wreck and then it was um scuttled uh, by torpedoes from Japanese destroyers as well. Um, so we're expecting it to be upright. The, uh, the island or the tower where the bridge was is, is not expected to be there. Uh, and the flight deck uh, mostly uh, destroyed. So we'll be doing a similar thing where we're gonna go around the, uh, the edge of the deck um, for about 360 degrees around the whole wreck. Um, dropping down periodically to look at uh, potential torpedo damage along the side of the hull. Uh, we'll then do a, uh, a pass over the flight deck to take a look at the damage there and then look at the debris field. I hope we see some of the mud line and the torpedo damage. I think I saw in the notes that um, it might be buried to a considerable amount in the mud, but we'll see. Yeah, um, we found with Yorktown and, and with Akagi, the, the sediment here is quite soft and these large vessels have, have sunk uh, fairly deeply into the sediment. So what we can see of the, of the hull will, will depend on that. I'd also like to invite our um, colleagues on shore. Um, I'm not quite sure who we have. Um, okay. over in Washington, D.C., but if you could please introduce yourself. I have not heard Shore check in yet, uh, and I'm not sure. We only have, I think, one account connected right now, and it, I don't think was Silver Springs. Okay, if we have any of our um, colleagues from Japan, um, feel free to jump on and introduce yourself, please. Okay, well, if you do jump on, uh, just let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to make space for you to introduce yourself as this is a collaborative effort. Um, we have many partners um, who've worked really hard to make this expedition happen. So collaboration is the name of uh, kind of the, the framework that we use here um, in Papahanaumokuakea and within the Ocean Exploration Trust. So we are um, very aware, um, you know, of the severity and significance of these sites and um, always honoring the lives that have been um, given during this battle. So you'll see uh, most of the, the, the staff here in the control van will, um, you know, we'll, we will have a very reverent attitude as we descend and um, 
explore the remains of the wreckage of the Imperial Japanese Navy Kaga. Do we have any idea about how long the time frame before we get down to the bottom? Well, we just passed uh, 4,500 meters, so um, probably the next half hour. Are we still stopping at 500s? Does not appear so. said it better myself. This was a very intense attack on the aircraft carrier Kaga. I think when we looked at the Akagi yesterday, you know, sadly there were some 200 and I think 67 casualties on the attack, but that was one of the lower numbers that were suffered on the aircraft carriers when they were attacked. I believe the number for the Kaga is more up towards 811. So this was a, you know, very violent and, and a, a, a terrible event. Yeah, and it kind of, um, the attack on Kaga actually led to the sinking of, um, of Akagi because uh, it was such a, a sudden and, and, and brutal attack for, with four bombs landing on the, uh, the flight deck that Ed Best or Dick Best and two of his uh, pilots uh, veered off uh, and because they saw Akagi in the, uh, in the distance and, and targeted that ship because you know they, they'd already seen bombs going off on Kaga and figured um, they didn't need to drop theirs as well. So um, the you know, the hits on, on Kaga led them to break off and, and target Akagi right after. So we learned from the um, Akagi that there were um, bombs um, on the decks that weren't, they didn't have time, they were they were kind of changing out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is Would that be the same scenario that played out on the Kaga? It is, yeah. So um, all, f all four Japanese carriers were switching over their... Um, their aerial bombs that were intended for Midway Island uh, to aerial torpedoes, which were because they had just learned of the uh, U.S. carriers uh, were in the area. Um, and that's when uh, the sort of surprise attack from, from the U.S. Uh, pilots um, descended on them. And so those bombs had not been put away below decks yet. And so, yeah, each, um, each of these attacks on, on Kaga, Akagi, and Soryu, which is, we believe, is somewhere to the northeast of us um, and has not been found yet, uh, detonated a lot of those bombs that were on the hangar deck still. And H Hiryu was the one uh, escaped uh, this particular attack and was, um, was bombed, I think, later in the day. Yeah, and, and the attacks, you know, damaged the fire suppression systems, which is, you know, even worse and the aviation gas lines those were ruptured as well so that's how the um, the fires spread and then the induced explosions following the bombs spread it's interesting I'm, I'm reading the uh, books recommended by uh, you get this one's dr. Brennan uh, the Pacific Crucible, and I'm on the Conquering Tide right now, and it, they keep uh, coming back to the point that the Japanese Navy did not have a big emphasis on damage control. Uh, they weren't as well trained as the Americans, and going into even some of the early World War II battles, 
uh, the Americans had novel approaches like clearing the fuel lines on the hangar deck and uh, replacing the fuel with CO2 to reduce fire risk. Yeah, and that was something, um, so actually Midway was the first time that uh, the Japanese Navy uh, lost a, uh, a carrier, or I think, yeah, a carrier uh, in, in World War II. They had, two of theirs had been damaged in uh, the Battle of Coral Sea, but not uh, badly. So, so uh, the Americans learned from the loss of Lexington a few weeks before this that um, the aviation fuel in the lines caught fire upon attack and, and developed the CO2 purging. Um, so it was kind of like a lessons learned from, from ships lost that um, is unfortunate but gave, gave an advantage in that. So Yorktown was fires were able to be put out because, because they had done that. So as we descend into the depths of um, Kanaloa, I wanted to give you a little bit of historical context um, regarding the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, where this expedition is taking place. Papahanaumokuakea is one of the largest marine protected areas in the world at over 582,000 square miles of marine and terrestrial ecosystems. There are over 7,000 different um, species that make their home in Papahanaumokuakea. And we have the largest extent of coral reefs um, within the United States. An incredibly diverse and pristine uh, land and seascape. But it does have impacts from, from anthropogenic sources or human um, sources. So we are um, some time near San Pedro, huh. living on a boat on Terminal Island, going oh, yeah. to College of Oceaneering. Wow, I have spent no shortage of time uh, waiting to get through security to get on the Fort Island. <laughs> that can get backed up at times. <laughs> it sure can, especially in the mornings yeah. when everybody's trying to get to work. Sebastian? Hey everyone, I'm Sebastian Martinez. I'm an undergraduate research at University of Hawaii at Manoa's Deep Sea Fish Ecology Lab. Um, I will be your guys' biologist for the next couple hours as we look at all this amazing archaeology. Mahalo, Sebastian. Hey, Derek, I, are you able to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Uh, Derek Sowers here. I work for Ocean Exploration Trust as the mapping operations manager, and I'll be serving as the navigator for this dive. Mahalo, Derek. What about you, Tito? Okay, Tito, we can't hear you. Oh, I'll boost him up. And if you can get your mic right Hit up the, against uh, your, whoa, there you go. Down on the SPL. Yeah, there you go, that's good. Let's try this. All right, good morning. Yeah, this that's is so uh, much better. Can you hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, Alberto Colacious Jr., otherwise uh, known as Tito. I'm a regular employee at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute as chief pilot and expedition leader with Jason. And I'm out here uh, moonlighting a bit uh, for the next couple of weeks and uh, really excited about diving on Kaga this morning. <coughs> What about you, Jake? All right, I'm Jake Bonney. I'm sitting here in the Atalanta seat. And uh, at, at home, I'm a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island studying ocean engineering. And last but not least, Ed. You know, uh, I am going to pass on my intro today, just uh, being mindful of the intent of this dive. So I'm passing. Yes, and you know what? Thank you for bringing that up because we have been um, from the beginning being very respectful and honoring the deep 
and long history of the place that we are currently in and the modern history uh, that occurred with uh, the Battle of Midway in 1942. And so as we descend into the depths of Kanaloa, the god of the ocean, from the Hawaiian perspective, we honor the life that was, um, sh you know, taken uh, by the tragedy of war. And we have a deep reverence for the events that occurred. So we're going to pass it on to our archaeologists um, if they want to give us a little bit of historical context on what we'll be seeing down um, on the seafloor. Mike? Yeah, thanks, Malia. Um, so Kaga was, um, uh, portions of the wreck were found in 2019 by the Nauticos uh, expeditions. Um, and then the, the wreck was found in 20, I'm sorry, that was 1999. And in 2019, it was found in uh, with a AUV survey uh, by Vulcan Inc. Uh, off the research vessel Petrol. Um, and they did a, a quick, uh, I think like hour or 90 minute dive to confirm the identity. So, so there has been eyes on this wreck. Um, and we're going to come down and do uh, a little bit more thorough of a, of a dive. Um, I expect that it's going to be um, similar in appearance to the Akagi dive from yesterday. Um, this, this wreck was hit, or this ship was hit uh, four times with bombs um, on the flight deck, and then similarly uh, caused massive fires uh, throughout the wreck, and then it was um, scuttled uh, by torpedoes from Japanese destroyers as well. Um, so we're expecting it to be upright. The, uh, the island or the tower where the bridge was is, is not expected to be there. Uh, and the flight deck uh, mostly uh, destroyed. So we'll be doing a similar thing where we're going to go around the, uh, the edge of the deck um, for about 360 degrees around the whole wreck, um, dropping down periodically to look at uh, potential torpedo damage along the side of the hull. Uh, we'll then do a, uh, a pass over the flight deck to take a look at the damage there and then look at the debris field. I hope we see some of the mud line and the torpedo damage. I think I saw in the notes that um, it might be buried to a considerable amount in the mud, but we'll see. Yeah, um, we found with Yorktown and, and with Akagi the the sediment here is quite soft, and these large vessels have, have sunk uh, fairly deeply into the sediment. So what we can see of the of the hull will, will depend on that. I'd also like to invite our um, colleagues on shore. Um, I'm not quite sure who we have um, okay. over in Washington, D.C., but if you could please introduce yourself. I have not heard shore check in yet, uh, and I'm not sure. We only have, I think, one account connected right now, and it, I don't think was Silver Springs. Okay, if we have any of our um, colleagues from Japan, um, feel free to jump on and introduce yourself, please. Okay, well, if you do jump on, uh, just let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to make space for you to introduce yourself as this is a collaborative effort. Um, we have many partners um, who've worked really hard to make this expedition happen. So collaboration is the name of uh, kind of the, the framework that we use here um, in Papahanaumokuakea and within the Ocean Exploration Trust. So we are um, very aware, um, you know, of the severity and significance of these sites and um, always honoring the lives that have been um, given during this battle. So you'll see uh, most of the, the, the staff here in the control van will, um, you know, we'll, we will have a very reverent attitude as we descend and um, 
explore the remains of the wreckage of the Imperial Japanese Navy Kaga. Do we have any idea about how long the time frame before we get down to the bottom? Well, we just passed uh, 4,500 meters, so um, probably the next half hour. Are we still stopping at 500s? Does not appear so. said it better myself. This was a very intense attack on the aircraft carrier Kaga. I think when we looked at the Akagi yesterday, you know, sadly there were some 200 and I think 67 casualties on the attack, but that was one of the lower numbers that were suffered on the aircraft carriers when they were attacked. I believe the number for the Kaga is more up towards 811. So this was a, you know, a very violent and, and a, a, a terrible event. Yeah, and it kind of um, the attack on Kaga actually led to the sinking of um, of Akagi because uh, it was such a, a sudden and, and and brutal attack for, with four bombs landing on the uh, the flight deck that Ed Best or Dick Best and two of his uh, pilots uh, veered off uh, and because they saw Akagi in the uh, in the distance and and targeted that ship because you know they they'd already seen bombs going off on Kaga and figured um, they didn't need to drop theirs as well so um, the you know, the hits on, on Kaga led them to break off and, and target Akagi right after. So we learned from the um, Akagi that there were um, bombs um, on the decks that weren't, they didn't have time, they were they were kind of changing out. Yeah. Um, is Would that be the same scenario that played out on the Kaga? It is, yeah. So um, all, all four Japanese carriers were switching over their... Um, their aerial bombs that were intended for Midway Island uh, to aerial torpedoes, which were because they had just learned of the uh, U.S. carriers uh, were in the area, um, and that's when uh, the sort of surprise attack from from the U.S. Uh, pilots um, descended on them, and so those bombs had not been put away below decks yet, and so yeah, each um, each of these attacks on on. Kaga, Akagi, and Soryu, which is, we believe, is somewhere to the northeast of us um, and has not been found yet, uh, detonated a lot of those bombs that were on the hangar deck still. And H Hiryu was the one uh, escaped uh, this particular attack and was, um, was bombed, I think, later in the day. Yeah, and, and the attacks, you know, damaged the fire suppression systems, which is, you know, even worse and aviation gas lines those were ruptured as well so that's how the um, the fires spread and then the induced explosions following the bombs spread it's interesting I'm, I'm reading the uh, books recommended by uh, you get this once dr. Brennan uh, the Pacific Crucible, and I'm on the Conquering Tide right now, and it, they keep uh, coming back to the point that the Japanese Navy did not have a big emphasis on damage control. Uh, they weren't as well trained as the Americans, and going into even some of the early World War II battles, 
uh, the Americans had novel approaches like clearing the fuel lines on the hangar deck and uh, replacing the fuel with CO2 to reduce fire risk. Yeah, and that was something, um, so actually Midway was the first time that uh, the Japanese Navy uh, lost a, uh, a carrier, or I think, yeah, a carrier uh, in, in World War II. They had, two of theirs had been damaged in uh, the Battle of Coral Sea, but not uh, badly. So, so uh, the Americans learned from the loss of Lexington a few weeks before this that um, the aviation fuel in the lines caught fire upon attack and, and developed the CO2 purging. Um, so it was kind of like a lessons learned from, from ships lost that um, is unfortunate but gave, gave an advantage in that. So Yorktown was fires were able to be put out because, because they had done that. So as we descend into the depths of um, Kanaloa, I wanted to give you a little bit of historical context um, regarding the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, where this expedition is taking place. Papahanaumokuakea is one of the largest marine protected areas in the world at over 582,000 square miles of marine and terrestrial ecosystems. There are over 7,000 different um, species that make their home in Papahanaumokuakea. And we have the largest extent of coral reefs um, within the United States. An incredibly diverse and pristine uh, land and seascape. But it does have impacts from, from anthropogenic sources or human um, sources. So we are um, always on the lookout for some of those what the always on the lookout for some of those what those impacts could be. Um, we are co-managed, a very unique co-management system that includes NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, includes the Office of Hawaiian Affairs the State of Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So this co-management cool um, framework is very unique, but also very robust, and allows us to um, protect uh, the sanctity of this sacred place. Um, why is it sacred? Um, Native Hawaiians consider Papahanaumokuakea to be the genesis or the place where life began. Um, we consider it a place of Po, where our ancestors, where our deities, where life begins, and the place where we return to after our death. We return to Po. And so it is considered an Aina Akua, a realm of the gods, a realm of the ancestors. And we enter this place with that understanding and with that reverence. So we want to welcome all of our uh, visitors. We have many people from the United States, the United Kingdom, 
uh, Japan, Canada, Germany, Italy, Turkey, uh, the Philippines, the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, Russia, Norway, Ireland, Hungary, Greece, France, and Australia. So welcome friends from all over the world. Hungary's on my list to visit. More of Eastern Europe. Tito, I probably was giving direct incorrect information earlier. Did you go to school after the Navy or? I did not. Oh, okay, great. Uh, nor, uh, my, I'm rocking my high school diploma over here. Uh, GED. Oh, University even better. Awesome. The first commander I, uh, of the ship USS Patterson, which I went to in Bath, Maine, uh, insisted I go get my GED as uh, I was only 17 when I showed up. Yeah. Um, so I was telling Derek that uh, thanks to his doctorate and uh, with uh, Jake working, are you doing your master's or just undergrad now? You, are you doing, <laughs> you're in Roman's lab, right? I am, yeah. So, uh, uh, thanks to these two, the front row averages out to an associate's degree. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm, ac I'm actually glad you brought that up because a lot of people, we've actually gotten questions online over, you know, in the past, you know, oh, do I need a PhD to come out there? And, and we have people from all over the place with all sorts of levels of education. And, and basically what, what I tell people is you need the level of education that you need for the fields you want to get into. You know, um, don't get, uh, you can often be overqualified by getting too many degrees for jobs that you want. So there's huh. there's many different pathways to get onto ships like this and, and to participate. So, um, you know, follow follow your passion and, and take the, the sort of route that you, that you want to, um, to do, to do the, the topics that you like. Well said, Mike. We don't always have to have an academic degree to do this kind of wonderful exploration. Yeah, I jokingly tell friends and neighbors that I'm the dumbest guy on the boat. Well, that is, uh, that is uh, there's a an joke because, I mean, I think what really matters in this field uh, operationally is the experience. Uh, and that's why we emphasize so much trying to get people some, some field experience and share right. time. Uh, work really hard on our internship program is uh, get people the experience that they need to start building that career that they want yeah. they want to get into the field. And I'd like to point out that both you and I, Ed, are uh, both veterans. And uh, yeah. I've had yeah. many people tell me that that equates to a liberal arts degree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of being a waiter now that you mention it. <laughs> well, and I mean, to, to put a point on it, like, Tito's here mostly be, or because of his experience, not because of his GED. So you know, it, it's the it's the time at at it's sea the and the and the years, yeah, so. exactly. Thirty eight. Yeah, Thirty eight years. Yeah. Uh, I have more experience, but almost orders of magnitude less marine related than Tito does. <laughs> uh, I I didn't go to sea. My first mission at sea was in two thousand ten with Tito. And I'm going to say my, my biggest talent is being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> yeah. uh, Titanic discovery, uh, yeah. you know, first oceanographic cruise was that. Uh, you know, the year 2000, the Black Sea expedition, finding the third century and the uh, third century shipwreck in the anoxic layer. So, and on this cruise, of course, I uh, had no idea what this cruise was going to entail. <laughs> right. I knew we were it's coming out. It's not a bad the, one. Uh, but <laughs> just knocking my socks off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that combined with uh, persistence. And, although I think longevity in this arena comes not uh, nearly so much from competence as attitude. Uh, if you're a team player and willing to do and help others to accomplish the mission and be pleasant about it despite working in difficult circumstances, long hours, cramped quarters, time away from family, and uh, still have fun and enjoy it and get to work with great people. I think that's uh, super helpful. Couldn't agree more. 
I used to joke that not many people get to do this work, and uh, or most people don't get to do this work, and they don't know how lucky they are. Well, I'll say this, it's been a little while since I've made a, a last cruise on the NOAA ships, and Nautilus is giving me an opportunity to re-explore differences in my sleep patterns. Yes. Uh, we're fortunate in that the way we're staffed affords us the opportunity to uh, do 24-hour operations. Uh, I've worked on NOAA ships. I certainly appreciate the uh, magic of launching after breakfast and recovering before dinner every day. And uh, certainly, uh, I don't remember what day it was, maybe Fridays <clears throat> or Saturday? I don't know, days of the week don't mean anything out here, but uh, movie night on the fantail was always fantastic. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, and we would, uh, actually I learned this one from Webb Pinner, rotate one of the knuckle cranes inboard and then rig your hammock from that over to the rail. Oh, geez. And we would frequently watch the deep, which is really funny because in the tropics at night, the wind would catch the projector screen, which wasn't really a screen. It was over the hangar door, causing it to luff, which would give it this kind of surreal effect to the movie. You would watch what? The deep. I love that movie. Yeah. I thought that's what you said, yep. but I didn't, I didn't want to the jump deep. on it because I wasn't sure. <laughs> that movie's awesome. There, I've seen, there's like, I've only ever seen like five movies that people watch it see. It's like the same ones over and over again. Yeah, The Life Aquatic. Life Aquatic. <laughs> For some reason, uh, Zombieland. Oh, that's uh, funny. <laughs> see that one a lot. That one doesn't actually make as much sense as Life Aquatic. The Abyss. You gotta see The Abyss. The Abyss. I love that one too. Yeah. Uh, the Abyss is irritating because they haven't released a Blu-ray yet because James Cameron wants to do it himself and he's obviously been busy. So I'm like, come on, guys. I can't I'll watch my DVD on my big TV anymore. I'll mention it to him. Yeah, please do. Fun fact, my mom worked on The Abyss. We'll get her to make a Blu-ray. <laughs> That's all. What did she do on the on the movie? She was James Cameron's and Gillian Hurd's um, executive assistant. That's really cool. Cool. They, um, I think one of my favorite uh, facts about how they made that was it was all filmed in a pool, like a lot of his underwater mm -hmm. stuff, but they, they covered the pool with like uh, styrofoam bits to, yeah. to, to black everything out underwater, so it was like they were really deep. Um, They're doing that now with uh, reservoirs, with those black balls to keep the water temperature down. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to the deep. Or no, the abyss. Wrong, wrong underwater movie. Sebastian, aren't, was you, did your mom work uh, in California, or, or is your family from there? Yeah, she was living in L.A. at the time. And, oh. um, she, I think she was only around like 22, 23, I want to say, when she was doing it. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty fun thing to have on your resume. So Sebastian, uh, there's an interesting question. Um, what kind of biological communities have been found on uh, previous wrecks during this expedition? And do you expect to find the same on the Kaga? Fantastic question. Um, so, so far on these wrecks, we've kind of noticed um, three kind of major organisms. Um, the first are these white anemones that seem to really like hang out in higher places on the ship and any thin railings and ropes in particular as well. And I believe they're doing that to try to catch the flow, get better flow in this normally low food environment and try to maximize their nutrition. We've also see the, <coughs> seen bolosomid sponges that are completely clear. So these sponges live on stalks that allow them to project themselves further in the water column and also try to get more filter feeding foods like these anemones. 
And lastly, we've been seeing these, um, in the distance, these white eel-like fish. Um, we haven't had the opportunity to get a close-up look at them, so we can't exactly get a super positive ID at the moment. But they are white, which implies that they have lost their pigment. And uh, that's a commonality for many species down here at this depth. Mahalo nui, Sebastian. So we'll keep our eyes peeled and see if that kind of carries over to um, the Kaga as we descend. Hey Derek, um, how far are we? Are we just uh, like 15 or so miles from uh, Akagi? I, I was curious actually, because um, we're we're pre these ships sink pretty close, relatively close together. But I wasn't sure what the exact um, yeah distance was. Let me see if it's on this map. Uh, let me get back to you on that one. Yeah, sure, no worries. Hey, Mike, uh, have you talked to Renny about the tool he's developing for Nautilus personnel? Uh, I have not. So um, our navigation team, amongst the many data sets they have, is distance over ground traveled, and that is captured and tabulated and uh, tracked per expedition. So, uh, Renny, one of our navigator mappers extraordinaire, is creating a tool where you input the Nautilus expeditions you served on, and it tells you the total distance you traveled on the vessel. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. I remember years ago when we when we were starting with nautilus um dr ballard kept asking what <laughs> what's the total uh distance that nautilus has traveled and he kept asking us that over and over and it was because he was trying to mark when nautilus had traveled twenty thousand leagues uh right uh, i'm not i'm sure we've well surpassed that at this point but i don't know when that was but we were just like why do you keep asking that and, then, right, and, right. and we eventually teased yeah, out that yeah. that was the reason. Um, I'm sure, I don't think it had happened at that point, but I, I'm sure it has now. These impacts could be, um, we are co-managed, a very unique co-management system that includes NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, includes the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the State of Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So this co-management cool um, framework is very unique, but also very robust, and allows us to um, protect uh, the sanctity of this sacred place. Um, why is it sacred? Um, Native Hawaiians consider Papahanaumokuakea to be the genesis, or the place where life began. Um, we consider it a place of Po, where our ancestors, where our deities, where life begins, and the place where we return to after our death. We return to Po. And so it is considered an Aina Akua, a realm of the gods, a realm of the ancestors. And we enter this place with that understanding and with that reverence. So we want to welcome all of our uh, visitors. We have many people from the United States, the United Kingdom, 
uh, Japan, Canada, Germany, Italy, Turkey, uh, the Philippines, the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, Russia, Norway, Ireland, Hungary, Greece, France, and Australia. So welcome friends from all over the world. Hungary's on my list to visit. More of Eastern Europe. Tito, I probably was giving direct incorrect information earlier. Did you go to school after the Navy or? I did not. Oh, okay, great. Uh, nor, uh, my, I'm rocking my high school diploma over here. Uh, GED. Oh, University even better. Of Awesome. The first commander I, uh, of the ship, the USS Patterson, which I went to in Bath, Maine, uh, insisted I go get my GED as uh, I was only 17 when I showed up. Yeah. Um, so I was telling Derek that uh, thanks to his doctorate and uh, with uh, Jake working, are you doing your master's or just undergrad now? You, are you doing, <laughs> you're in Roman's lab, right? I am, yeah. So, uh, uh, thanks to these two, the front row averages out to an associate's degree. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm, not, I'm actually glad you brought that up because a lot of people, we've actually gotten questions online over, you know, in the past, you know, oh, do I need a PhD to come out there? And, and we have people from all over the place with all sorts of levels of education. And, and basically what, what I tell people is, you need the level of education that you need for the fields you want to get into. You know, um, don't get, uh, you can often be overqualified by getting too many degrees for jobs that you want. So there's uh, there's many different pathways to get onto ships like this and, and to participate. So, um, you know, follow follow your passion and, and take the, the sort of route that you, that you want to, um, to do, to do the, the topics that you like. Well said, Mike. We don't always have to have an academic degree to do this kind of wonderful exploration. Yeah, I jokingly tell friends and neighbors that I'm the dumbest guy on the boat. Well, that is, uh, that is uh, there's a an joke because, I mean, I think what really matters in this field uh, operationally is the experience. Uh, and that's why we emphasize so much trying to get people some, some field experience and share right. time. Uh, work really hard on our internship program is um, get people the experience that they need to start building that career that they want yeah, they want to get into the field. And I'd like to point out that both you and I, Ed, are uh, both veterans. And uh, yeah. I've had yeah. many people tell me that that equates to a liberal arts degree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of being a waiter now that you mention it. <laughs> well, and I mean, to, to put a point on it, like, Tito's here mostly be, or because of his experience, not because of his GED. So you know, it, it's the it's the time at, at sea uh, and the and the years, yeah, so. exactly. Thirty-eight, yeah, thirty-eight I, years, yeah. Uh, I have more experience, but almost orders of magnitude less marine-related than Tito does. <laughs> uh, I I didn't go to sea. My first mission at sea was in 2010 with Tito. And I'm going to say my, my biggest talent is being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> yeah. uh, Titanic discovery, uh, yeah. you know, first oceanographic cruise was that. Uh, you know, the year 2000, the Black Sea expedition, finding the third century and the uh, third century shipwreck in the anoxic layer. So, and on this cruise, of course, I uh, had no idea what this cruise was going to entail. <laughs> right. I knew we were it's coming out. It's not a bad the, one. Uh, but <laughs> just knocking my socks off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that combined with uh, persistence, and, although I think longevity in this arena comes not uh, nearly so much from competence as attitude. Uh, if you're a team player and willing to do and help others to accomplish the mission and be pleasant about it despite working in difficult circumstances, long hours, cramped quarters, time away from family, and uh, still have fun and enjoy it and get to work with great people. I think that's uh, super helpful. Couldn't agree more. 
I used to joke that not many people get to do this work, and uh, or most people don't get to do this work, and they don't know how lucky they are. Well, I'll say this. It's been a little while since I've made a, a last cruise on the NOAA ships, and Nautilus is giving me an opportunity to re-explore differences in my sleep patterns. Yes. Uh, we're fortunate in that the way we're staffed affords us the opportunity to uh, do 24-hour operations. Uh, I've worked on NOAA ships. I certainly appreciate the uh, magic of launching after breakfast and recovering before dinner every day. And uh, certainly, uh, I don't remember what day it was, maybe Fridays <clears throat> or Saturday. I don't know, days of the week don't mean anything out here, but uh, movie night on the fantail was always fantastic. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, and we would, uh, actually I learned this one from Webb Pinner, rotate one of the knuckle cranes inboard and then rig your hammock from that over to the oh, rail. Geez. And we would frequently watch the deep, which is really funny because in the tropics at night, the wind would catch the projector screen, which wasn't really a screen, it was over the hangar door, causing it to luff, which would give it this kind of surreal effect to the movie. You would watch what? The deep. I love that movie. Yeah. I thought that's what you said, yep. but I, I didn't want to jump deep. on it because I wasn't sure. <laughs> that movie's awesome. There, I've seen, there's like, I've only ever seen like five movies that people watch at sea. It's like the same ones over and over again. Yeah, The Life Aquatic. Life Aquatic. <laughs> For some reason, uh, Zombieland. Oh, that's uh, funny. I <laughs> see that one a lot. That one doesn't actually make as much sense as Life Aquatic. The Abyss. You gotta see The Abyss. The Abyss. I love that one too. Yeah. Uh, the Abyss is irritating because they haven't released a Blu-ray yet because James Cameron wants to do it himself and he's obviously been busy. So I'm like, come on, guys. I can't I'll watch my DVD on my big TV anymore. I'll mention it to him. Yeah, please do. Fun fact, my mom worked on The Abyss. We'll get her to make a Blu-ray. <laughs> what did she do on the on the movie? She was James Cameron's and Gil and Hurd's um, executive assistant. That's really cool. Cool. They, um, I think one of my favorite uh, facts about how they made that was it was all filmed in a pool, like a lot of his underwater mm -hmm. stuff, but they, they covered the pool with like uh, styrofoam bits to, yeah. to, to black everything out underwater, so it was like they were really deep. Um, They're doing that now with uh, reservoirs, with those black balls to keep the water temperature down. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to the deep. Or no, the abyss. Wrong, wrong underwater movie. Sebastian, aren't, was you, did your mom work uh, in California, or, or is your family from there? Yeah, she was living in L.A. at the time. And, oh. um, she, I think she was only around like 22, 23, I want to say, when she was doing it. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty fun thing to have on your resume. So Sebastian, uh, there's an interesting question. Um, what kind of biological communities have been found on uh, previous wrecks during this expedition? And do you expect to find the same on the Kaga? Fantastic question. Um, so, so far on these wrecks, we've kind of noticed um, three kind of major organisms. Um, the first are these white anemones that seem to really like hang out in higher places on the ship and any thin railings and ropes in particular as well. And I believe they're doing that to try to catch the flow, get a better flow in this normally low food environment and try to maximize their nutrition. We've also see the, <coughs> seen bolosomid sponges that are completely clear. So these sponges live on stalks that allow them to project themselves further in the water column and also try to get more filter feeding foods like these anemones. 
And lastly, we've been seeing these um, in the distance, these white eel-like fish. Um, we haven't had the opportunity to get a close-up look at them, so we can't exactly get a super positive ID at the moment. But they are white, which implies that they have lost their pigment. And that's a commonality for many species down here at this depth. Mahalo nui, Sebastian. So we'll keep our eyes peeled and see if that kind of carries over to um, the kaga as we descend. Hey, Derek, um, how far are we? Are we just uh, like 15 or so miles from uh, Akagi? I, I was curious, actually. Um. Because we're we're pre these ships sink pretty close, relatively close together, but I wasn't sure what the exact um, yeah distance was. Let me see if it's on this map. Uh, let me get back to you on that one. Yeah, sure, no worries. Hey, Mike. Uh, have you talked to Renny about the tool he's developing for Nautilus personnel? I have not. So um, our navigation team, amongst the many data sets they have, is distance over ground traveled. And that is captured and tabulated and uh, tracked per expedition. So. Uh, Renny, one of our navigator mappers extraordinaire, is creating a tool where you input the Nautilus expeditions you served on, and it tells you the total distance you traveled on the vessel. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. I remember years ago when we when we were starting with Nautilus, um, Dr. Ballard kept asking, "What? <laughs> what's the total?" Uh, distance that Nautilus has traveled, and he kept asking us that over and over, and it was because he was trying to mark when Nautilus had traveled 20,000 leagues. Ah, uh, right. Uh, I'm not, I'm sure we've well surpassed that at this point, but I don't know when that was. But we were just like, why do you keep asking that? And, right, then, and, right. and we eventually teased yeah, out that yeah. that was the reason. Um, I'm sure, I don't think it had happened at that point, but I, I'm sure it has now, and I'm not sure when that was. Uh, now and I'm not sure when that was. Uh, there's uh, few, if any, uh, mm -hmm. left from the earliest days of Nautilus when it was acquired by OET. But there's a photo mm -hmm. album in the lounge that documents what the vessel looked like back in those days. And it's pretty well, remarkable. Oh, I need to take a look at that. <laughs> it's remarkable. Yeah, so to answer your question, Mike, um, yeah. looks like we're about 17 and a half nautical miles away. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's about what I thought it was. But uh, yeah, I mean, so probably just over the... Well, uh, John Parshall actually just let let me know that... Um, so Kaga remained under power um, for hours and cr and was able to crawl a good ways from Akagi before she went to, before she was scuttled. Um, so they, they had been inside of each other and probably... Uh, were not at the time of the, that they were sunk. Because I think the horizon's usually like, I think 12 to 15 miles away. So they were probably just over the horizon. Could probably see the smoke from each other though. Yeah, that, uh, that 12 miles sounds right. That's yeah. at like six feet above water, I think. Like if you go to the beach, yeah, you see 12 miles away. And yeah, John agrees that uh, they could see each other's smoke columns at the time of their sinking, but but not the actual ships. But they were they were a lot. I don't know what exact distance, but they were, they were quite a bit closer um, when the attack happened. Because as we know, the the U.S. pilots were able to see them each from the air and and adjust their attack. One of the first-hand accounts I read of uh, an American pilot was uh, when they found the. Uh, Imperial Japanese fleet, how much the carrier stood out because their flight deck was yellow and the, this first-hand account was saying you didn't know if it was the type of wood or if they were painted, 
but it certainly made them stand out targets. Yeah. I don't know if they painted their deck yellow or they were using some wood that had that or stain, you know, just, but... Uh, I know that there was um, paint because they, they each had um, the, the red uh, rising sun on, mm -hmm. the, on the bows. Oh, uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So John agrees that the, the flight decks were yellow and they all had the red Hinomaru circles uh, on the on the bows. Did, did Japan ever field carriers that were purpose-built carriers that weren't just like battleship yeah. hulls and then... Yeah, so um, Zuikaku and Shokaku were their newer right. carriers. They were, they were smaller and faster. Uh, and they were the ones that were damaged in the Battle of Coral Sea, mm -hmm. uh, which kept them out of the fight in Midway. Had that not happened, um, you know, the, the the forces would have been would have been very different, uh, and the battle might have been very different. Also, you know, the U.S. had had lost their Lexington carrier, which was uh, one of the original carriers as well. So, the Battle of Coral Sea was definitely very impactful on on what ended up uh, being the the fleets at Midway. Yeah, so many chain of events had to line up perfectly for this outcome. Yeah. Even the repair crew on the Yorktown, if that had not been repaired and was still smoking, yep. uh, it wouldn't have drawn its second attack, and that would have been directed elsewhere. And John Parshall actually says that Soryu and Hiryu were purpose-built carriers, and Soryu was the first one. And then the other two I mentioned. Hi everyone, can y'all hear me okay? Okay. Yep. Yay, hi everyone, this is Tori. Um, I'm just joining us now on watch after doing a ship to shore. Um, and I'm curious, how far we do we know from the bottom or the wreck site? Uh, right now we have another, I'm gonna say about 10 or 12 minutes to go. Wow. Uh, our okay. expected depth is 5,366 and we're at just going past 5,150 at 25 meters a minute. Troy, you've got a uh, booked day in that studio doing interactions to different yes. groups, huh? I'll be honest with you, and I hope some of the schools that I've talked to, one was my school, um, I hope some of y'all are listening now, but um, for viewers that are listening, when I say these ship to shore interactions, um, you can sign up to have these like one-on-one -on -one conversations with crew uh, while we're sailing. So I just talked to two squirrels so far this morning, but we've got like maybe like, I don't know, like nine or 10 today. Oh, that um, was and funny. it's so fun, just so amazing to go in and just show um, kind of what we've been up to, but share about this work, share about our experiences, just share about exploration um, and get people like plugged into what's going on. Um, so, Yes, it was a really good time. And, and that one was about 45 minutes, and I even went a little bit longer. To sign up for something like that, they could go to nautiluslive.org and click yeah. on Join Us. Yeah, and education, or on the Nautilus Live site, if you click um, at the very top where you see education, there are so many educational resources. And I've mentioned it before, but I'm a high school science teacher, and the free educational resources that are available are amazing um, and live ship to shore interactions is an option and if you click learn more you are able to fill out a google form and request a specific day and time we accommodate any time of the day uh, malia hours. and i were up at 1 20 this morning <laughs> talking to my school on the east coast seven. yeah and on those google forms you can request specific people and interactions are available from May to December, but if there's like a specific expedition that you are wanting to get your classroom plugged into, um, you can definitely do that. And it's not just classes or, or classrooms in like traditional public school or private school settings. Um, we had one recently with um, some elders in like a senior living uh -huh. um, home, and that was like a very special one for me to participate in. Yep, and we also have um, community events. Yeah. Um, we'll be hosting one from this Saturday uh, through the Mokupa Papa Discovery Center in Hilo, which is kind of our um, center. Oh. And um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. And then also, I wanted to really highlight something very unique um, to the Ocean Exploration Trust, 
Yeah. And the work that we're doing with Ship to Shore is that we have instituted um, Ship to Shore interactions in Olelo, Hawaii, mm. which is the Hawaiian language. And that's been a really um, amazing opportunity for our Kulakai Apuni or our Hawaiian Immersion School students and teachers to interact with crew in the Hawaiian language. Yeah. We've had uh, several crew members who speak Olelo, Hawaii, and are able to share with our young, um, our youth of Hawaii potential careers and um, academic pursuits mm -hmm. um, that they would be just amazing in bringing their cultural knowledge and science um, backgrounds into spaces like this as we explore um, indigenous spaces like Papahanao Mokoakea. So if any of you out there um, are Hawaiian language speakers um, interested in signing up your haumana um, to have these interactions, please go to the Nautilus Live um, website and sign them up. We'd be happy. We have a speaker on board. We also have um, Hawaiian language speakers on shore that can help um, facilitate the interactions. Mm -hmm. And I'll say too, like, uh, for me, when I was growing up, I've always loved the ocean and I've always like just dreamed of learning about the ocean, but I thought the only way I could really do that was to get like a marine biology degree. And I am just like totally blown away and amazed by everyone's careers out here. And that's like my favorite thing to share on these ship to shore interactions is just all the possibilities. Right. So, and you know, we shared earlier about, you know, people's journeys to get to this oh, place good. and yeah. really highlighted that, you know, if, if academia is not for you and college degree is not for you, um, that's okay because there are other avenues to, um, you know, be doing this kind of work. Yeah. So we encourage you, don't let, um, you know, a college degree scare you from um, entering into a field that you love. Yeah. Hey, this is Tito again. I was uh, 100 meters off. Uh, we're going to 5440, and that's going to take uh, another three or four minutes uh, in addition to what I had mentioned. Oh, that is uh, quite a bit deeper than uh, than yesterday. 120 wow. meters, yeah. I believe, yeah. So we had someone online who asked if it would be possible to tell us um, depth in meters, feet, and phantoms. Is that something that we could share um, with our viewers? On our the Nautilus Live website, mm -hmm. it does show the depth and it toggles between meters and feet. Uh, but I'm sure we can. But uh, 5,400 meters is right around 16.5, I want to say, in feet. Oh. And that would be uh, divided uh, three, 3.18 miles. Yep. And about 2,700 fathoms. Uh, I'm looking for a Units plus. It's about it's about eight uh, eighteen thousand feet. What's feet. our uh, target depth? Five four four six. Yes, five four four. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So uh, seventeen thousand eight hundred sixty-seven feet. Uh, what did I say for miles? Three point three eight. Wow. Well, and I'm, I'm guessing 7,900 PSI? Uh, what would it be? 545? I know it's not linear, but close enough. This is the first time that I'm hearing the unit fathoms before. So now I'm just sitting here Googling 545. fathoms and when Six we feet. use this unit. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Right on the money there, Jake. 8,000. Yep, 11.5 PSI. Ooh, Although it's apparently cells. as you get into deep <laughs> or like deep water, the 14.7 is not a linear computation. The yeah. water on top is actually compressing. A, mm -hmm. I think it's marginal, but 14.7 gives you a ballpark, just not. Fully you can do accurate. a quick back of the hand calculation is 1.5 times the water depth in meters, and that's actually you're overestimating. You're being conservative. Oh, yeah. So. Yep. The deeper idea. you go, it kind of it evens out. And some sonar return there. How many miles did you say it was? 3.3? 3.38. 3.38. So 
so we should be getting altimeter hits quite soon. Well, thank you to our front row. I'm sure our viewer is very happy to hear that. <laughs> I just want to share something that's, um, I know definitely special for me about just being here aboard EV Nautilus and sailing and even just being in the control van is all the learning that happens. I feel like every single second that I'm aboard the ship and um, I'm just so grateful for everyone for sharing their knowledge. We've all got um, very unique backgrounds and journeys to coming to the ship, but it's just amazing. And I love this like learning community and I appreciate people's willingness to be vulnerable and ask questions when they don't know something and then also being just gracious and teaching if they do. Um. Thank you for that. Yes, it is a team effort in everything that we do on board the Nautilus and um, everybody brings something amazing to the table. So we hope you folks uh, listening at home are um, enjoying all the different areas of expertise from the staff that are in the control van. And um, we're looking forward to um, a very historic and um, amazing dive on the Imperial Japanese Navy Kaga, part of the Battle of Midway in 1942. I'm starting to see something come in on the sonar. Is that? It's possible. It's okay. something. We're getting into their <coughs> scan or two of it first. Um, we're about 100 meters off, so yeah, we could start to, see, yeah, it looks like we're starting to see it now. Yeah. Um, we're a little uh, bit off site. Sonar is set at 30 meter scale, so that's uh, okay. 125, 130 meters and away. And that makes sense. Uh, we're, yeah. we're about 80 meters off bottom, so um, I think the top of the, I think the top of the tower is about 90 meters, actually. And no, no, 90 feet, 90 feet. Okay. Sorry, Tito, I was going to ask, you said the sonar scale is 30 meters? That's correct. Right now, in yeah. between There's the rings? There's five grades there, so yeah, total of about 150 meters. Mm -hmm. that, we may change that during the dive, though. It's uh, not an absolute. Mm -hmm. We will. I had it on a larger scale just, to, just for this. <coughs> Altimeter showing about 30 meters off bottom. Camera's looking straight down. There's uh, few, if any, mm -hmm. uh, left from the earliest days of Nautilus when it was acquired by OET. But there's a photo album in the lounge that documents what the vessel looked like back in those days. And it's pretty oh, remarkable. Oh, I need to take a look at that. <laughs> it's remarkable. Yeah, so to answer your question, Mike, um, yeah. looks like we're about 17 and a half nautical miles away. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's about what I thought it was, but uh, yeah, I mean, so probably just over the, well, uh, John Parshall actually just let let me know that, um, so Kaga remained under power um, for hours and cr and was able to crawl a good ways from Akagi before she went, to, before she was scuttled. Um, so they, they had been inside of each other and probably uh, were not at the time of the, that they were sunk. Because I think the horizon's usually like, I think 12 to 15 miles away. So they were probably just over the horizon. Could probably see the smoke from each other though. Yeah, that, uh, that 12 miles sounds right. That's yeah. at like six feet above water, I think. Like if you go to the beach, yeah, you see 12 miles away. And yeah, John agrees that uh, they could see each other's smoke columns at the time of their sinking, but but not the actual ships. But they were they were a lot. I don't know what the exact distance, but they were, they were quite a bit closer um, when the attack happened. Because as we know, the the U.S. pilots were able to see them each from the air and and adjust their attack. One of the first-hand accounts I read of uh, an American pilot was uh, when they found the. Uh, Imperial Japanese fleet, how much the carrier stood out because their flight deck was yellow and the, this first-hand account was saying you didn't know if it was the type of wood or if they were painted, 
but it certainly made them stand out targets. Yeah. I don't know if they painted their deck yellow or they were using some wood that had that or stain, you know, just, but... Uh, I know that there was um, paint because they, they each had um, the, the red uh, rising sun on, mm -hmm. the, on the bows. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So John agrees that the, the flight decks were yellow and they all had the red Hinomaru circles uh, on the on the bows. Did, did Japan ever field carriers that were purpose-built carriers that weren't just like battleship yeah. hulls and then... Yeah, so um, Zuikaku and Shokaku were their newer right. carriers. They were, they were smaller and faster. Uh, and they were the ones that were damaged in the Battle of Coral Sea, mm -hmm. uh, which kept them out of the fight in Midway. Had that not happened, um, you know, the, the the forces would have been would have been very different, uh, and the battle might have been very different. Also, you know, the U.S. had had lost their Lexington carrier, which was uh, one of the original carriers as well. So, the Battle of Coral Sea was definitely very impactful on on what ended up uh, being the the fleets at Midway. Yeah, so many chain of events had to line up perfectly for this outcome. Yeah. It, even the repair crew on the Yorktown, if that had not been repaired and was still smoking, yep. uh, it wouldn't have drawn its second attack, and that okay. would have been directed elsewhere. And John Parshall actually says that Soryu and Hiryu were purpose-built carriers, and Soryu was the first one. And then the other two I mentioned. Hi everyone, can y'all hear me okay? Okay. Yep. Yay, hi everyone, this is Tori. Um, I'm just joining us now on watch after doing a ship to shore. Um, and I'm curious, how far we do we know from the bottom or the wreck site? Uh, right now we have another, I'm gonna say about 10 or 12 minutes to go. Wow. Uh, our okay. expected depth is 5,366 and we're at just going past 5,150 at 25 meters a minute. Trey, you've got a uh, booked day in that studio doing interactions to different yes. groups, huh? I'll be honest with you, and I hope some of the schools that I've talked to, one was my school, um, I hope some of y'all are listening now, but um, for viewers that are listening, when I say these ship-to-shore interactions, um, you can sign up to have these like one-on-one -on -one conversations with crew uh, while we're sailing. So I just talked to two squirrels so far this morning, but we've got like maybe like, I don't know, like nine or 10 today. Oh, that um, was and fun. it's so fun, just so amazing to go in and just show um, kind of what we've been up to, but share about this work, share about our experiences, just share about exploration um, and get people like plugged into what's going on. Um, so, Yes, it was a really good time. And, and this, that one was about 45 minutes, and I even went a little bit longer. To sign up for something like that, they could go to nautiluslive.org and click yeah. on Join Us. Yeah, and education, or on the Nautilus Live site, if you click um, at the very top where you see education, there are so many educational resources. And I've mentioned it before, but I'm a high school science teacher, and the free educational resources that are available are amazing um, and live ship to shore interactions is an option and if you click learn more you are able to fill out a google form and request a specific day and time we accommodate any time of the day um, Leah and i were up at 1 20 this morning <laughs> talking to my school on the east coast yeah and on those google forms you can request specific people and interactions are available from May to December, but if there's like a specific expedition that you are wanting to get your classroom plugged into, um, you can definitely do that. And it's not just classes or, or classrooms in like traditional public school or private school settings. Um, we had one recently with um, some elders in like a senior living uh -huh. um, home, and that was like a very special one for me to participate in. Yep, and we also have um, community events. Yeah. Um, we'll be hosting one from this Saturday uh, through the Mokupa Papa Discovery Center in Hilo, which is kind of our um, center. Oh. And um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. And then also, I wanted to really highlight something very unique um, to the Ocean Exploration Trust. 
Yeah. And the work that we're doing with Ship to Shore is that we have instituted um, Ship to Shore interactions in Olelo, Hawaii, mm. which is the Hawaiian language. And that's been a really um, amazing opportunity for our Kulakai Apuni or our Hawaiian Immersion School students and teachers to interact with crew in the Hawaiian language. Yeah. We've had uh, several crew members who speak Olelo, Hawaii, and are able to share with our young, um, our youth of Hawaii potential careers and um, academic pursuits mm -hmm. um, that they would be just amazing in bringing their cultural knowledge and science um, backgrounds into spaces like this as we explore um, indigenous spaces like Papahanao Mokoakea. So if any of you out there um, are Hawaiian language speakers um, interested in signing up your haumana um, to have these interactions, please go to the Nautilus Live um, website and sign them up. We'd be happy. We have a speaker on board. We also have um, Hawaiian language speakers on shore that can help um, facilitate the interactions. Mm -hmm. And I'll say too, like uh, for me, when I was growing up, I've always loved the ocean and I've always like just dreamed of learning about the ocean, but I thought the only way I could really do that was to get like a marine biology degree. And I am just like totally blown away and amazed by everyone's careers out here. And that's like my favorite thing to share on these ship to shore interactions is just all the possibilities. Right, so. and you know, we shared earlier about you know people's journeys to get to this oh, place good. and yeah. really highlighted that you know if, if academia is not for you and college degree is not for you um that's okay because there are other avenues to um you know be doing this kind of work yeah. so we encourage you don't let um you know a college degree scare you from um, entering into a field that you love yeah Hey, this is Tito again. I was uh, 100 meters off. Uh, we're going to 5440, and that's going to take uh, another three or four minutes uh, in addition to what I had mentioned. Oh, that is uh, quite a bit deeper than uh, than yesterday. 120 wow. meters, yeah. I believe, yeah. So we had someone online who asked if it would be possible to tell us um, depth in meters, feet, and phantoms. Is that something that we could share um, with our viewers? On our the Nautilus Live website, mm -hmm. it does show the depth and it toggles between meters and feet. Uh, but I'm sure we can. But uh, 5,400 meters is right around 16.5. I want to say in feet, oh. and that would be uh, divided uh, three 3.18 miles. Yeah. And about 2,700 fathoms. Uh, I'm looking for you. Units plus. It's about it's about eight, uh, eighteen thousand feet. What's Pit? our uh, target depth? Five four four six. Yes, five four four. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So uh, seventeen thousand eight hundred sixty-seven feet. Uh, what did I say for miles? Three point three eight. Wow. Well, and I'm, I'm guessing 7,900 PSI? Uh, what would that be? 545? I know it's not linear, but close enough. This is the first time that I'm hearing the unit fathoms before. So now I'm just sitting here Googling 545. fathoms and when Six we feet. use this unit. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Right on the money there, Jake. 8,000. Yep, 8,000. 11.5 PSI. Ooh, Although it's apparently cells. as you get into deep <laughs> water, like deep water, the 14.7 is not a linear computation. The yeah. water on top is actually compressing. A, mm -hmm. I think it's marginal, but 14.7 gives you a ballpark, just not. Fully you can do accurate. a quick back of the hand calculation is 1.5 times the water depth in meters, and that's actually you're overestimating. You're being conservative, oh, yeah. so. Yeah. The deeper idea. you go, it kind of it evens out. And some sonar return there. How many miles did you say it was? 3.3? 3.38. 3.38. 
So we should be getting altimeter hits quite soon. Well, thank you to our front row. I'm sure our viewer is very happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. I just want to share something that's, um, I know definitely special for me about just being here aboard EV Nautilus and sailing and even just being in the control van is all the learning that happens, I feel like, every single second that I'm aboard the ship and um, I'm just so grateful for everyone for sharing their knowledge. We've all got um, very unique backgrounds and journeys to coming to the ship but it's just amazing and I love this like learning community and I appreciate people's willingness to be vulnerable and ask questions when they don't know something and then also being just gracious and teaching if they do. Um, Thank you for that. Yes, it is a team effort in everything that we do on board the Nautilus. And um, everybody brings something amazing to the table. So we hope you folks uh, listening at home are um, enjoying all the different areas of expertise from the staff that are in the control van. And um, we're looking forward to um, a very historic and um, amazing dive on the Imperial Japanese Navy Kaga, part of the Battle of Midway in 1942. Okay. I'm starting to see something come in on the sonar. Is that? It's possible. It's okay. something. We're getting into <clears throat> our scan or two of it first. Um, we're about 100 meters off, so yeah, we could start to see, yeah, it looks like we're starting to see it now. Yeah. Um, we're a little bit off site. Sonar is set at good. 30 meter scale, so that's uh, okay. 125, 130 meters And wide. that makes sense. Uh, we're, yeah. we're about 80 meters off bottom, so um, I think the top of the, I think the top of the tower is about 90 meters, actually. And no, no, 90 feet, 90 feet. Okay. Sorry, Tito, I was going to ask, you said the sonar scale is 30 meters? That's correct. Right now, In yeah. between There's the rings? five grades there, so yeah, total of about 150 meters. That mm -hmm. We may change that during the dive, though. It's uh, not an absolute. Mm -hmm. We will. I had it on a larger scale just to, just for this. <coughs> Alt altimeter showing about 30 meters off bottom. Camera's looking straight down. Looks like we're right over the wreck. Looks like we're right over the wreck, actually. Wow. Maybe. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, at least we're consistent. We'll plan to have a, a, a minute on the first side of the wreck. Sounds to good. To say some words. Are you planning to say that, um, Hans? Will you lead, that, lead us in that? I can do that. Okay, mahalo. So there is um, a large bit of debris on one, of, one side of the wreck. That might be the other target that we're seeing in the sonar. Um, I've got bottom. Yep. Yep. Bottom. Okay. It's strange though that we're not that we're getting a reflection past the uh, past the wreck. Yeah. We we did see in the mapping data that there was a debris field around it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Go to scale down the sonar. Right, range down the sonar. Uh, oh yeah, it's right in front of us. Wow. So at, at this point, we like to pause and, of course, we're here to understand the historical and archaeological information that these properties have to tell. But we recognize as well that the Battle of Midway and the events of World War II were momentous and catastrophic. And what we're looking at is a very somber and 
in a way, a, a sad place because this is a location of terrible loss of life. We were once enemies and now we're friends and allies and we can look back from a place of peace at what was a destructive and very violent confrontation. And that's part of the story that these wreck sites tell. And in doing that, we recognize the terrible loss of life of many sailors and airmen, many of whom were very young, some in their 20s, as our colleagues in Japan have reminded us yesterday, on both sides, and all those lost in the war. So foremost in our minds as we study these sites is recognition and respect and honoring those who were lost in the hope that we don't create more of these haunted sites in the future. So please join me for a minute of silence and recognition of the sacrifice and service of these many lives. Mahalo. Thank you. Thanks, Hans. Mahalo, Hans. Mahalo, thank you, Hans. Thank you, Hans. All right, so um, this is a good spot, actually, um, to come down so we can see the wreck right in front of us safely. Um, if we can move probably a little bit forward and up we can uh, see how how high it doesn't look very high in front of us actually no it uh, doesn't it looks like there's some sediment on top um but we'll, we'll slowly just like yesterday <laughs> the last dive we'll slowly get a sense of where we are we're somewhere amidships either port or starboard and that's about as much as we know at this point right okay. would we like to do a 20 meter move bearing Three, two. Um, I don't know if we want to go that far mm -hmm. forward. Um, what's the uh, what's the scale on the sonar now? Uh, ten. ten meters. Yeah, I wouldn't even move ten meters. I mean, we want to. We still want to stand off a little bit. I mean, we can see it. So maybe like maybe start with five. Okay. We just want to get that sweet spot where our, our lights. Illuminate it well what enough, what and we're not you like? right up against what it or over it. You like? Thinking with that. There. Okay. There's a uh, horizontal band in front of us that looks like an attachment to the uh, larger portion that I'm not sure I've seen elsewhere, but. Could even do a zoom while we bridge nav. Slide over if you want. We'd like to do a ship move five meters bearing zero two five. Thank you. If it is in fact this far buried in sediment, we're not going to be needing to do very many vertical moves. And actually, right. the the side scan from um, 
from the Vulcan Inc., the petrol survey, it does kind of show it as low relief, doesn't it? There's not much shadow on it. Yes, and, and we also, uh, this morning when we mapped with our multi-beam, we, we really didn't see relief in the bathymetry at the resolution we can measure that from yeah, this, this, at this depth. This so. could be um, buried up higher to the uh, the gunnels than, uh, than, the, than Yorktown or Akagi. Uh, Ed, I've got some debris in the yeah. field of view. Yeah, see push? what that is. Awesome. Yeah, they, they mentioned buried to the degaussing wires. Hold okay. On. Runaway zoom, sorry. Run away again. Mm. Mike, you used the word guttles. What does that mean, or where is that at? Uh, the, the gunnel is like the, uh, it's, uh, like, it's along the deck edge. Um, and it's uh, actually gun whale, but it's just, uh, uh, over time, uh, sailors shortened it to gunnel. Kind of mm -hmm. like how Fork House became Foxel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it used to be the whale or timber that the guns shot over. The gun whale. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's what history does to you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, stand by. So at least in this image, we have a, uh, the north indicator arrow. Oh, that's helpful. So I'm trying to guess on our sonar if if up is north on the sonar. Yeah, we're looking, no, we're looking, um, well, right now we're looking due east. So oh, okay, we're looking due east. I think, I think the, mm, then we're, so we're maybe. looking, the, we're looking that way. I had just seen a piece of debris so on we're the ocean side. bottom, so I'm going to turn we're back we're towards the, the uh, yeah. towards the wreck, which was, uh, Bearing around zero two Which five. is why we saw that in the sonar. The high return behind it, yeah. perhaps. Um, yeah. And I think that's supposed to be the stern. Combating yeah. runaway zooms over here. Right, so, so if we're on this side, this to would this say, suggest the bows to our the left. bows to the left, yeah. Uh, Are you thinking of sorry. moving towards the bow first or towards the stern? Um, I'm not sure that moving um, clockwise would feel right. <laughs> We've done counterclockwise each to each dive. <laughs> what do you think, Hans? <laughs> That's uh, one or the other. I'm fine either way. Let's be consistent. Yeah, let's go to the right. I just, it, it's like um, I dive some of the, the springs in, uh, in North Florida, and I have to go a certain way in the caverns because it just feels wrong to go the other, <laughs> the other way. Like Janine's springs okay. and stuff. Uh, hold on, Kenton, uh, stand by team. So, uh, uh, the can the report the that Shoreside is having an issue with our streams. A different uh, camera um, setup once we get down. Uh, and what do we do, Dive? So we're on the port side, which means we're on the not the stacker and tower side. That's right. If we're moving aft, you know, this vessel did have those lower 20 centimeter casemate guns. Oh yeah, like, like all, did. All towards the stern. Uh, what are you guys looking at over there? Head two. Uh, multi two, pip one. Something like that. Oh, thank you. Bet you those are buried. They could be. And boy, the, you know, the, the top edge, I don't even think we're looking at anything near the flight deck. Yeah. This looks flattened. I think hey, it's... Hey, Nautilus, uh, short five. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Mike, can you confirm the range of the sector scanning sonar, please? It's uh, 10 meters per line right now. I'll be thinking. Sure, are you able to uh, uh, see uh, video okay? 
appreciate the question. Uh, video is, is coming in. We had to do uh, some refreshing on some screens, but currently smooth and really exciting. Thank you. Um, coming in on this band. So, sorry, I uh, I do not have control of the zoom motor. It looks like a line of portholes. I'm looking for those on yeah, the diagram. I think it's um. Do we know that this is main rack and not just a fragment? Like, uh... Hmm. Because it seems to break off to port, well, I our think, port. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the scanning sonar, there's more to our left and right. I think this is just a, um, a drop in, um, in part of the side. Yeah, when we came down, we had 30 meter divisions okay. on the sonar, and we saw the whole wreck right in front of us. And would you like me to change the 30 meters for a moment or two? I'm, I'm good. I'm not good science. But there is a significant piece of the wreck some distance away, um, Tito, off of the starboard side. But I thought we were seeing the, the wreck as well on the sonar coming down. Yeah, this is, I mean, if you look at the sonar now, this is, this is for sure the main part of the wreck. Yeah. Um, um, I'm just, not, we're just, we just need to figure out where exactly, we're somewhere amidships, we need to figure out where exactly and how much of it's buried. All and right, it's I'm surprising going to 30 to meters again. Surprising to see that there's, I think that's, isn't that sediment on top? That looks like sediment on top. It's, mm -hmm. it must have kicked up quite a bit. Okay, sonar is set to 30 meters again to just give us a an idea of scale. Yeah, the track actually. Wow. Uh, Maybe. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, at least they're consistent. We'll plan to have a a, a minute on the first side of the wreck Sounds to good. say some words. Are you planning to say that, um, Hans? Will you lead, that, lead us in that? I can do that. Okay, mahalo. So there is um, a large bit of debris on one of one side of the wreck. That might be the other target that we're seeing in the sonar. Um, uh, got bottom. Yep. Yep. Bottom. Okay. It's strange though that we're not that we're getting a reflection past the uh, past the wreck. Yeah. We we did see in the mapping data that there was a debris field around it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Go to scale down the sonar. Right, arrange down the sonar. Uh, oh yeah, it's right in front of us. Wow. So at, at this point, we like to pause and, of course, we're here to understand the historical and archeological information that these properties have to tell. But we recognize as well that the Battle of Midway and the events of World War II were momentous and catastrophic. And what we're looking at is a very somber and, in a way, 
a, a sad place because this is a location of terrible loss of life. We were once enemies and now we're friends and allies and we can look back from a place of peace at what was a destructive and very violent confrontation. And that's part of the story that these wreck sites tell. And in doing that, we recognize the terrible loss of life of many sailors and airmen, many of whom were very young, some in their 20s, as our colleagues in Japan have reminded us yesterday, on both sides, and all those lost in the war. So foremost in our minds as we study these sites is recognition and respect and honoring those who were lost in the hope that we don't create more of these haunted sites in the future. So please join me for a minute of silence and recognition of the sacrifice and service of these many lives. Mahalo. Thank you. Thanks, Hans. Mahalo, Hans. Mahalo, thank you, Hans. Thank you, Hans. Yeah. Mahalo, thank you, Hans. All right, so um, this is a good spot, actually, um, to come down so we can see the wreck right in front of us safely. Um, if we can move probably a little bit forward and up we can uh, see how how high it doesn't look very high in front of us actually no it um, doesn't it looks like there's some sediment on top um but we'll, we'll slowly just like yesterday <laughs> the last dive we'll slowly get a sense of where we are we're somewhere amidships either port or starboard and that's about as much as we know at this point right okay. would we like to do a 20 meter move bearing Three, two. Um, I don't know if we want to go that far forward. Um, what's the uh, what's the scale on the sonar now? Uh, ten. ten meters. Yeah, I wouldn't even move ten meters. I mean, we want to. We still want to stand off a little bit. I mean, we can see it. So maybe like maybe start with five. Okay. We just want to get that sweet spot where our, our lights. Illuminate it well what enough, is, and we're not like? right up against what it or over would it. You like? Thinking with that. Okay. There's a uh, horizontal band in front of us that looks like an attachment to the uh, larger portion that I'm not sure I've seen elsewhere, but. Could even do a zoom while we bridge nav. Slide over if you want. We'd like to do a ship move five meters bearing zero two five. Thank you. If it is, in fact, this far buried in sediment, we're not going to be needing to do very many vertical moves. And actually, right. the, the side scan from, um, 
from the Vulcan Inc., the petrol survey, it does kind of show it as low relief, doesn't it? There's not much shadow on it. Yes, and, and we also, uh, this morning when we mapped with our multi-beam, we, we really didn't see relief in the bathymetry at the resolution we can measure that from yeah, this, this, at this depth. This so. could be um, buried up higher to the uh, the gunnels than, uh, than, the, than Yorktown or Akagi. Uh, Ed, I've got some debris in the yeah. field of view. Would you see what that is. Awesome. Yeah, they, they mentioned buried to the degaussing wires. Oh, okay. Runaway zoom, sorry. Run, run away again. Mm -hmm. Mike, you used the word gunnels. What does that mean, or where is that at? Uh, the, the gunnel is like the, uh, it's, uh, like, it's along the deck edge. Um, oh, and it's uh, actually gunwale, but it's just, uh, uh, over time, uh, sailors shortened it to gunnel. Kind of mm -hmm. like how Forecastle became Foxel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it used to be the whale or timber uh, that the guns shot over, the gun whale. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's what history does to you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, stand by. So at least in this image, we have a, the, the north indicator arrow. Oh, that's helpful. So I'm trying to guess on our sonar if if up is north on the sonar. Yeah, we're looking, no, we're looking, um, well, right now we're looking due east. So oh, okay, we're looking due east. I think, I think the, mm, then we're, so we're maybe. looking, the, we're looking that way. I had just seen a piece of debris so on we're the ocean on side. bottom, so I'm going to turn we're back we're towards, the the, uh, yeah. towards the wreck, which was, uh, Bearing around zero two Which five. is why we saw that in the sonar. The high return behind it, yeah. perhaps. Um, yeah. I think that's supposed to be the stern. Combating yeah. runaway zooms over here. Right, so, so if we're on this side, this so would this say, suggest the bows to our the left. The bows to the left, yeah. Uh, Are you thinking of sorry. moving towards the bow first or towards the stern? Um, I'm not sure that moving um, clockwise would feel right. <laughs> We've done counterclockwise each to each dive. <laughs> what do you think, Hans? <laughs> That's uh, one or the other. I'm fine either way. Let's be consistent. Yeah, let's go to the right. I just it, it's like um, I dive some of the, the springs in uh, in North Florida, and I have to go a certain way in the caverns because it just feels wrong to go the other, the other way. <laughs> like Janine's springs okay. and stuff. Uh, hold on, Kenton, uh, standby team. So, uh, uh, the getting a report get that Shoreside is having an issue with our a, streams. A different uh, camera uh, setup once we get down. Uh, and what do we do, dive? So we're on the port side, which means we're on the not the stacker and tower side. That's right. If we're moving aft, you know, this vessel did have those lower 20 centimeter casemate guns. Oh, yeah, like, like all, a did. All towards the stern. Uh, what are you guys looking at over there? Head two. Uh, right, multi viewer two, pip one, something like that. Oh, thank you. Bet you those are buried. They could be. And boy, the, you know, the, the top edge, I don't even think we're looking at anything near the flight deck. Yeah. This looks flattened. I think hey, it's... Hey, Nautilus, uh, short five. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Mike, can you confirm the range of the sector scanning sonar, please? It's uh, 10 meters per line right now. Copy, thank you. So are you able to uh, uh, see uh, video okay? 
appreciate the question. Uh, video is, is coming in. We had to do uh, some refreshing on some screens, but currently smooth and really exciting. Thank you. Um, coming in on this band. So, sorry, I, uh, I do not have control of the zoom motor. It looks like a line of portholes. I'm looking for those on yeah, the diagram. I think it's, um, we know that this is main rack and not just a fragment, like uh, hmm, because it seems to break off to port. Well, I our think, port. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the scanning sonar, there's more to our left and right. I think this is just a um, a drop in um, in part of the side. Yeah, when we came down, we had 30 meter divisions okay. on the sonar, and we saw the whole wreck right in front of us. And would you like me to change to 30 meters for a moment or two? I'm, I'm good. I'm not about science. But there is a significant piece of the wreck some distance away, um, Tito, off of the starboard side. But I thought we were seeing the, the wreck as well on the sonar coming down. Yeah, this is, I mean, if you look at the sonar now, this is, this is for sure the main part of the wreck. Yeah. Um, um, I'm just, not, we're just, we just need to figure out where exactly, we're somewhere amidships, we need to figure out where exactly and how much of it's buried. All and right, it's I'm surprising going to 30 to meters again. Surprising to see that there's, I think that's, isn't that sediment on top? That looks like sediment on top. It's, mm -hmm. it must have kicked up quite a bit. Okay, sonar is set to 30 meters again to just give us a, an idea of scale. 